Okay, so in this section of the course what we're going to be focusing on is breaking them by the assumption of linearity, that is that there is a linear relationship between the covariates and the mean of our response variable or the uh, the mean as fed through a link function. So the example that we've got here to motivate us is a data set of the number of bioluminescent sources detected at uh, a range of different depths, so essentially dropping a sensor down into the water column, uh, taking several readings, in this case looks like four readings at each uh, uh, depth, and um, counting the number of bioluminescent sources. And what you can see is that it drops off with depth, perhaps uh, linearly, it's a little hard to tell, and then uh, around somewhere between 2,000 and 3,000 meters depth, it um, abruptly declines towards uh, zero. So there's all sorts of models you could fit to this, but when it, it, it might be in the situation where we really don't know exactly what the correct structure is or how much complexity to attach to this particular kind of data. And so the approach that we're going to use to try and explore that question is what is called additive modeling uh, as opposed to linear modeling. And the idea here is that what you're going to do is be is adding nonlinear functions together uh, instead of fitting uh, linear functions. The nice thing about these this class of models is that they can be combined with linear terms as well, although this first example will simply have a single nonlinear term. So how do we go about fitting a nonlinear model? Well, you may well have heard of the of the uh, concept of smoothing uh, a curve through your data. We've seen smooth curves fit through our residual plots uh, and a variety of other sorts of smooths in other sorts of descriptive situations. And that's basically what's going to go on inside these models. Um, technically, what the, the models that we'll be using are a little more complicated than this, but um, it's easier to explain what goes on inside what's what's called a locally weighted sum of squares smoother. So we'll start there. And it's possible to use a locally weighted sum of squares smoother in, in these models. It's just the particular software package that works uh, well doesn't use this um, kind of smoother. But basically what a, a smoother does is it picks a series of points, in this case indicated by the uh, one of which is indicated by the red dot, that are called knots. And the, at each of these knots, what, it's, what the smoother does is calculate some sort of uh, function. In this case, for a locally weighted sum of squares smoother, the function is a straight line. And it's not fit through the entire data, but rather some proportion of the data that's close to, in uh, some sense, the knot and other data points are ignored. So in this case the knot is at a uh, depth of 1500 and the span of the smoother um, goes from 1000 to 2000 and you fit a straight line through that point. And so for that point then what that gives us is two numbers. One is the the value of the function at that point and the other is the slope of the function at that point, the, the derivative. And you do this for each of your knots and then you string the whole bunch of them together and that's your smooth fit. Okay, so one thing that's the degree of smoothing then in this case is going to be controlled by how wide that that span is. If the span is very narrow you're going to get a very wiggly line because it's only going to be looking at those few points right immediately closest and if it's a very wide span you're going to get a much smoother line because it's going to be changing less. There's going to be the same points will be included in each uh, knot. So here's an example. This is not a Lois one. This is what's called a thin plate regression spline. Uh, these are the ones that we'll be working with. Um, and for the thin plate splines, the degree of smoothness of the curve is controlled by uh, specifying how many degrees of freedom we want the curve to have, with more degrees of freedom equaling more wiggliness in our function, as you'll see in a moment. And so what I've done here is is have the model fit a uh, smooth spline, a thin plate spline with five degrees of freedom. And so what it looks like is that, you know, again, there's a fairly linear decline down to about 2500, and then it 
flattens out quite dramatically. The dashed lines are the standard errors of the fitted curve. Okay, so what happens as we change this number of degrees of freedom in, in the model? Well, so here's the same data set now, but what I've done is fix the degrees of freedom at 3, so a, um, a smaller number, indicating a greater degree of smoothing, approximately a quadratic curve in this case. And you can see that the, it's, the main effect has been down in the region between uh, 2,500 and 5,000, where instead of bumping up and down a little bit, the function is just making a smooth quadratic curve uh, through those data points. And for comparison now, here's that uh, degree of freedom equals 5 smooth, um, with the degree of freedom equals 3 smooth in the dashed line in the background. And we can further increase the number of degrees of freedom in our smoother up to 8, and now you can start to see there's it seems to be bouncing up and down quite a bit to capture some of the um, small scale variation um, but it's doing it's not doing quite as good a job at, at some of those uh, points missing some of those curves that's because the curve is constrained in the extent to which it can bend right it has to maintain a smooth uh, derivative everywhere through through the um, throughout the range of the function Um, and so you might say, well, this seems kind of ad hoc, you know, okay, so we can go up, we can choose 12 as our degree of freedom, and now we're getting all kinds of structure in there now. There's this real kink in the, in the curve up here between 1,000 and 1,500. See, that, that seems all pretty ad hoc. How do we decide what the appropriate number of degrees of freedom is? Well, you may have theoretical reasons uh, to choose one degree um, amount of smoothing over another. But um, in this particular case, what we're doing is um, there's another approach we can use, which is to um, allow the smoothing uh, function to decide what the best degree of smoothing is by looking, f uh, essentially penalizing more complex smooths in a manner very similar to how we've penalized additional complexity in an AIC analysis. But we can allow the smoothing software to do this um, automatically using a process called generalized cross-validation which looks which measures how well the function matches the observed data and uh, when we do that with this particular data set um, we get the red line which has approximately 8.8 .8 degrees of freedom and so one of the things that's interesting about this is that the the uh, degrees of freedom for these functions don't have to be integers anymore now they can be um, any value. So it's pretty close to our former um, smooth with, it's sort of midway between the smooth with 8 degrees of freedom and 12 degrees of freedom. And that little bit of kink there in the uh, between 1000 and 1500 sort of persists, so th that might suggest to us that in fact um, there really is some biologically interesting phenomenon going on uh, as you move deeper, it's not simply a smooth decrease with a bit of extra noise in the middle, it's actually um, something interesting going on. And th there could be all sorts of reasons for that, I don't know much about bioluminescence. So this, in, this then is, is sort of how we're going to proceed with these generalized additive models. Um, this one here has used an identity link and a Gaussian error distribution. But as you'll see, we don't have to uh, stick with uh, within those constraints. We can use um, all sorts of other uh, kinds of, of smooths in order to obtain a good um, match between the model and the kind of data that we've collected. Here's an example. Um, we haven't looked at this type of model yet, but these are in fact uh, similar to logistic regression models where they're predicting um, the rate at which uh, female cowbirds uh, lay eggs into red-winged blackbird nests. And um, the functions were, are, were pretty much linear uh, with log odds link functions for um, almost every uh, component of the model except for
the average nest age. And this is where we, we used a smooth term in this particular case. This is work that was done by a PhD student, Max Post Vanderberg, who's now at the uh, USGS Northern Prairie Research Center. And uh, what Max found was that average nest age parasitism rate sort of peaked right in the middle of the period of time at which female red-winged blackbirds are filling up their nests. Um, and then it sort of dropped after that quite, quite dramatically. Um, and this sort of nonlinear pattern had never been reported in the literature before, perhaps because nobody had ever really looked for a pattern that was nonlinear, that always looked for linear functions, and often had looked for quadratic functions, but a quadratic function can't capture this kind of sharp spike followed by a, a flat period. Um, it's simply not going to work, and given that you ha often have relatively little data early on in the nesting period, a linear function ends up fitting much better.